Congressman Adam Kinzinger's fun time in his schedule for us. Congressman, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, guys. What's going on? How was Fourth of July weekend for you? Uh, it was great. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the family, which was nice. And, uh, you know, now I'm ready to get back to work. Had my coffee today, as I'm sure you fellows are. And uh, <laughs> let's go to it. I bet ours is better than yours. Uh, yeah, I bet it. You always <laughs> had a great coffee. i got to get in there at some point again. Soon. I, I uh, saw you showing off your, your right to bear arms uh, on your Twitter feed over the weekend. Yeah, how'd you like that? We uh, <laughs> on on... Uh, July 4th day, went to uh, the family farm down in Ford County and uh, did a lot of shooting. Uh, shot the AR-15 that I have and 9mm and my new uh, my new um, concealed carry gun, which is a three eighty. So it was a good time. Spent a lot of rounds. Outstanding. Hey, you know, you, next time you need a couple of guys to go down there with you, you know, hang targets or something like that, we'd be happy to tool along. We'll bring the coffee. Yeah, actually, you don't hang targets. I would have you guys just hold them out there. <laughs> <laughs> Go from there. All right, out at arm's length, guys. Close your eyes. Now put this straw in your mouth. <laughs> I'll this apple off, I promise. Uh, Congressman Adam Kinzinger with us here. Uh, we get to the, uh, uh, well, the Boehner lawsuit, the immigration um, um, question, too. But uh, jobs report from Thursday, which seems like forever ago after this long weekend, one of the more promising jobs reports we've seen in a little bit, uh, jobs almost 300,000. Uh, the unemployment rate down, though, I think if you talk to most people, they say it doesn't feel like 6.1% out there. It's still hard. Something that has not been talked about too much, uh, the fact that the past six months we've seen okay job growth, it coincides with the, uh, with the um, lapsing of the emergency unemployment benefits. And a lot of Democrats yeah. said, you can't do this. The sky's going to fall. Unemployment's going to skyrocket. This is crazy. And instead, we, we actually have seen um, some, some gro job growth over these past six months. Well, you know, that's right. I mean, and, and actually, many economists, or most economists that actually know what they're talking about, uh, said that long-term unemployment was actually... And, and, I mean, it's understandable. It was actually causing people not to go out and look for work. And I'm sensitive to the fact that there are people whose unemployment expired that are having a hard time finding jobs. But on the macro scale, what you have is you know, somebody going out and looking for work and getting offered a job that pays as much or maybe just slightly more than they would make on unemployment. Uh, it's understandable then at that point that they would say, well, look, I'm, I'm going to continue to receive unemployment in some cases because, you know, in essence, I'd be working for free. And... So a lot of the reports we saw that act said that actually about 1% of unemployment would go away if, in fact, we, um, we, we stopped this long-term unemployment bill. And, you know, the problem with Washington, D.C. is uh, temporary things always become permanent. Mm -hmm. And while we understand that, you know, in a really bad economy, it was appropriate, and I voted for a few years ago a last kind of one-term extension of that unemployment, there's a point at which you have to say, Okay, no more. And the president can't have his cake and eat it, too. He's out saying we're in a recovery, which I would argue uh, maybe, you know, a slight recovery. Uh, but you can't say that we're in a recovery, but yet we're still so bad that we have to have this long-term unemployment. So I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I think it's, it's uh, while it's uncomfortable for some, and I'm very, very sensitive to that, at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot of people are out looking for jobs, and, and, and more people are finding work. And it's still an astounding number of people, though, who just have thrown their hands up and said, you know what, I, I, I can't, uh, I, I've been at it, I've been at it, I've been at it, I've been at it, what, there, there, there's nothing for me there. Yeah, especially folks that, you know, find themselves, I guess, maybe about 10 years shy of what would be kind of Social Security or Medicare age, and, you know, folks in their 50s that have, have in some cases, lost their job, maybe in manufacturing or something else, and now we're out trying to retrain and find work, and it's very difficult for those folks. And that's why I think, you know, it's important to have these kind of job training programs to continue to stimulate the economy through the private sector to allow, you know, there to be more opportunities for people. And let me just say one last thing on this. Illinois, if you go up to Wisconsin or you go to, you know, Indiana or Kentucky or wherever, um, Illinois has a much even more negative feeling than those states because of our state government. And while Illinois is a phenomenal state, with all these things, you know, the Rockford Airport, great air uh, airports all over the state. We have great interstates, great waterways, uh, strong agriculture, strong manufacturing. The problem is the state government has crushed Illinois. The good news is we can change that in November. Congressman Adam, Adam Kinzinger with us here, Illinois' 16th District. It's Riley and Scott on WROK. 
Uh, House Speaker John Boehner, op-ed at uh, CNN.com uh, over the weekend, and we've heard uh, about this. He's pushing forward with it. Sometime this month, we'll ask members of the House to authorize a lawsuit against the president, saying that he has circumvented Congress with executive actions. He has overreached, so to speak. Is this a good idea? Yeah, I mean, I, I commit this very, you know, uh, I, I don't like having to do this, but we have to do it. Um, you know, it, it, it ultimately seems like a failure of government when um, one branch has to result, has to, to res, you know, go to suing another branch. It feels like the system's not working, but Frankly, it's not working. And what we've seen is the president, through executive actions, basically saying, I mean, he said this. He, he's just said this. He said, look, if Congress isn't going to do what I want, then I'm going to do what I want through executive actions. Well, you know, we don't have a dictatorship here. We don't have a, a royalty, a, a kingdom. We have a democracy and a republic. And sometimes that republic may not proceed to work exactly how the president wants it to work and you know and and maybe the house republicans don't buy hook line and sinker everything the president says but that doesn't mean that he gets to go out and do this by fiat and an interesting point on this um and this is where i'm concerned that the lawsuit won't be successful or i guess ultimately won't be heard is really the failure comes partially by the supreme court the supreme court for the last 20 or 30 years has kind of had this idea that they won't get involved in disputes between the executive and legislative branch because they say basically that's politics and we're not going to interfere in the political system. The problem is the Supreme Court was actually created partially to do exactly that, to, mm -hmm. to, to legislate disputes between the executive and legislative branches. And, uh, and by them failing to get involved, they've allowed the president uh, to go out and kind of run amok. Now, uh, of course, the, the last few decisions we saw, Hobby Lobby and everything else, uh, kind of was a slap to the president, maybe showing that the court's more willing to get involved. But the idea, and then, you know, it's been listed over and over again. It's no, it, there, there's nothing new in it, but when you, you look at the number of czars, you look at the amount of times, you know, when you look at the Supreme Court slapping back the recess appointments, the idea of unilateral action just because you feel like it and you can say, well, Congress, look at their approval rating. That's why I'm doing it. I don't think that's really what the founders had in mind. No, absolutely not. And look, I, there's nobody more aware of Congress's low approval rating than me, and I've been critical of how Congress has acted in many cases. Um, but that said, uh, Congress is a legitimate branch of government. And, you know, if you want to get rid of Congress and get rid of the legislative branch and have a dictatorship, uh, good luck, you know, fighting that fight. But this isn't, this isn't um, you know, this isn't Syria, this isn't uh, Iran, this is the United States of America. And while the president may want really, really, really badly to get his legislative agenda done, there's a way to do it. And I think the president had many opportunities right when he was elected and even right when he was reelected to find some areas of common ground with Republicans to try to get some of his big ticket items done. But the problem is he, he reverted to candidate Obama, which he's doing now, where he goes out and just attacks Republicans. It's always interesting to me. Uh, I think the president has attacked Republicans more in the last two months than he's attacked ISIS or anybody like that. And just goes to show his mindset is all about the next election. Congressman Evan Kinzinger with us here, Riley and Scott on WRK. We have this continued crisis on the southern border, unaccompanied minors, tens of thousands. That's specifically in a second, but your uh, Illinois colleague, Senator, Senator Dick Durbin, um, from the Senate side, on Face the Nation this weekend, uh, ripping uh, the House Republicans, and by extension, you, for not passing the Senate immigration bill. Here's the audio. Now let me see the second point. I am really getting fed up with some of the critics of this administration, particularly from House Republicans. They had the opportunity for one solid year to call the immigration reform bill, and yet they refused to. And now they're arguing we need more enforcement at the borders and a lot of other things. When are they going to accept their responsibility to govern, to call this bipartisan bill for consideration? Does anybody really take Dick Durbin seriously anymore? <laughs> I can't I mean, believe that they would. Yeah, I mean, this guy is nothing short of a, simply a political hack. Uh, he's, frankly, it's embarrassing for our state. Uh, he's really good at politics, right? He's, he's excellent at that. But, you know, calling American troops in Iraq, you know, in essence, the SS soldiers and knocking down doors and, you know, terrorizing, I've never forgiven him for, for what he did to our American soldiers and what he called them. And now on this to say, 
you know, that the House Republicans aren't doing anything. Look, I've been a long proponent of saying we've got to do immigration reform, which starts with serious, serious border security. Uh, but that said, this is Dick Durbin, who has a leadership position in the U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate has decided they're not going to pass anything this year. Mm-hmm. And I think that the number of bills the U.S. Senate has passed has actually been a paltry. So fine, he can go on and say that, you know, I'm going to blame House Republicans again. But anybody that does their homework that really looks at how many bills the House has passed versus how many bills the Senate has passed uh, would definitely see that we're out doing our work. You may not agree with every aspect of work we've done, but why don't you actually pass some of your bills and put it out there, too? They haven't done it. So I don't take Dick Durbin seriously anymore. And Unfortunately, though, he has a big megaphone at times. <laughs> hey, but, Congressman, uh, <laughs> as you look at what's happening on the border, we know you've seen this from above, from some of your, uh, from yeah. some of your missions, what, what's happening on the U.S.-Mexico border, that the president has told us time and again the border's never been more secure. <laughs> We're deporting more people than ever before. Uh, the numbers don't necessarily play that out. But h- how can you and House Republicans be expected to move on immigration reform when, A, uh, obviously the border is not secure with tens of thousands of unaccompanied kids coming across, and B, going back to the, uh, to the, to the lawsuit, you know that whatever you pass, the president might just change on, on a whim anyway. Yeah, I think that's been the big issue. Uh, I've talked to a lot of my colleagues who have said, you know, look, we don't trust at the end of the day that if we pass border enforcement that the president's actually going to do it. And, uh, and I think they have a strong argument for that. And, you know, look, it's, it's, again, it's the president being, you know, dictating by fiat whatever he wants to do, he's going to do through executive action. Yeah, I've flown the border of Mexico. I've done, I worked out of McAllen, Texas with the Air National Guard, and I think I talked, I was on your show, like, right after I did it. Mm-hmm. And then, before you had this issue with unaccompanied minors, you had an extremely porous border, and I talked about how you'd watch a group cross one area, the Border Patrol would respond, and then they'd send another group across in another area because they knew the Border Patrol was responding. I mean, these coyotes that ferry people over are very good at what they do. And uh, now what you have, though, is these large groups of unaccompanied minors are, being a- are actually finding Border Patrol. Border Patrol now is humanely bound to take care of them. And meanwhile, you get drug traffickers, you know, illegals crossing the border, and who knows how many, I mean, if, if you're a terrorist organization, aren't you thinking this is a good opportunity to start ferreting some of your folks over the southern border? And so this is really tragic. This is a, a, a sad. And I think from the humane side of this, there are a lot of kids that are being raped on the way over here, killed, uh, taken advantage of. And, uh, you, you know, we, this, is, this is really a sad thing to see happen. The president and the administration trying to have it both ways here, I think, Congressman. At the same point, uh, they're asking you and and the Senate for $2 billion to, to help take care of the uh, unaccompanied child issue. And he wants to expedite deportations for some of those children. But at the same time, he's threatening to take executive action to delay deportation of, of those who have already made it across and then act surprised when people say his policies are encouraging people to come across the border. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's. I wish I could read Spanish because I would. I would see, and I, I've been told that the uh, newspapers in Central and South America, when the president basically made his announcement that unaccompanied children or children will not be sent home, was basically the front page of those papers said, "Send your kid to America; they're going to be Americans." And mm-hmm. look, you can understand, and we have to be compassionate. You can understand, you know, if you're a parent in Central and South America and you've been living in decades of violence. By the way, this violence in that area is not new. This isn't like something that's happened in the last year. Um, but you can understand their desire to send a kid to a better life. But you also can understand that in the United States of America, we have a right to determine our immigration policy. We've always been very liberal in terms of immigration and allowing people to come to the United States. But we have to do that as a sovereign nation with an immigration policy that right now completely doesn't work because of the poorest border. Congressman Adam Kinzinger with us, Riley and Scott on WYOK. Um, one more uh, question. Um, we turn to Iraq, where uh, the, the fighting continues, ISIS continues on the move. What um, you, You're on the record calling for airstrikes, and that's been uh, a few weeks. Uh, is there still time in your mind? Are airstrikes still a good idea, or has that opportunity passed us by? Are we now forced to react to a new set of circumstances in Iraq? I don't think it's passed us by yet, but I think it is expanding when we do airstrikes. I think it's going to expand the territory we have to do them in. Because, you know, I just saw a report recently that said the Pentagon is split on whether or not to do airstrikes. That's understandable. They're humans with different views on, on things. 
but that that's paralyzed the White House. I mean, the White, this president is unable to make an executive decision unless it has to do with going around Congress. <laughs> when it comes to leadership, he's unable to do it. The problem now, ISIS has declared that their next target is Jordan. Jordan is a very close ally of the United States and actually a very close ally of Israel. We have got to take the threats of ISIS and ISIL very seriously that their next target is Jordan. And Jordan, if that falls, you will now have Israel surrounded by this very, very terrible terrorist organization. And who knows now? I mean, they're only one country away from bridging into Europe. So mm -hmm. This is a very serious situation, and I think the longer we wait to push ISIS back, the bigger the territory we're going to have to strike them at, Syria, Iraq, and maybe now Jordan at some point. Congressman Adam Kinzinger, as always, thanks for taking time out of your day for us. Of course, guys. Thanks a lot. It was good talking to you. Happy late fourth. Take you care. Too.